Hello. I'm good, Stephanie. How are you? Hmm. Well, no, it was just for you. Like, you know how when we did the virtual, you were keeping an eye on other screens, making sure nobody was putting up any funny business? Yeah. This is today at starting at 12. I'm sorry, I didn't I didn't write that down properly in the original message. I'm sorry about that. No, Jacob, Jacob uh, switched it over. Originally, they were trying to figure out that webinar stuff, but Jacob always likes to do the meeting because that way everybody can see each other and stuff. Well, and also what I did, because I saw that the list didn't have any details, I noted who's on the board from the registration, so at least you know those right off the top. Okay? All right, and if you need anything, just text me, okay? Because I'm going to have my phone right there if anything else comes up. Okay? Okay, see you in a little bit. Bye-bye. Good to see you. Thanks for setting it up. My pleasure. Yes. We're just letting a few more people in and then we'll begin. I think there's a few more people in the waiting room. Lashana Tova. Shana Tova. Is everyone uh, here, uh, Beverly? I would start, yeah. I mean, we have a few people, so it's going to take well, a while for everybody to just, come in. Well, let's just give it one or two more minutes just so people can get in. Shalom, everyone. We're just letting people into the room. Okay. 
think we'll start. Shalom, everybody, and Shana Tova. Uh, my name is Fred Klein. I serve as the director of Mishkan Miami, the spiritual care initiative of the Greater Miami Jewish Federation. I also serve as the executive vice president of the Rabbinical Association. And I'd like to personally invite all of you to today's special program, part of our 40 Days and 40 Nights program. This 40-day program of study and prayer was developed by our rabbis in partnership with our Synagogue Federations Relations Committee at our Federation to provide people with spiritual resources during the extraordinary period in which we find ourselves. It's been a period of study, of workshops, of prayer, and of inspiration. And I think we can all agree how much we need this these days. There are still a few programs left in the coming days, and I encourage you to join at jewishmiami.org. Under the leadership of the president of the Rabbinical Association, Rabbi Rachel Greengrass, we have tried to make the most of this time leading up to Yom Kippur. And I'd be remiss if I did not recognize the support of the Synagogue Federation Relations Committee, chaired by Rabbi Jeremy Barris and Stephen Sheck. I'd also like to thank the 40 Days Advisory Group, which included Rabbis Robin Fisher, Adam Gindea, Lila Haas, and Efrat Zarin Zohar, as well as the incredible team at Federation, specific, and especially Bonnie Ryder and the entire communications team, who always amaze me with their professionalism and expertise. I'd like to finally thank our Chief Planning Officer, Michelle Labgold, whose advice in bringing this program to fruition was invaluable. Finally, a special shout out goes to Beverly Horvitz, my assistant, for ensuring all of us stayed on track. By way of introduction, we all know we are living in unprecedented and tumultuous times, both as a Jewish people and also a world. No one, and I would emphasize that, no one would have ever guessed 5780 turned into what it became, but here we are. But here we are. More than ever, we would have liked to hope to have a prophet someone to tell us what will happen, and more importantly, what exactly we should do. However, this is not the first time that the Jews have faced radical uncertainty. In fact, if you think about it, Jewish existence, at least until the establishment of the State of Israel, and possibly even after, has needed to constantly negotiate with a tomorrow that was indeterminate, that was unclear. Our rabbis teach, by the time the second temple was destroyed, also prophets were silent, and God's message was entrusted to the scholars, the rabbis, the daily conversation, the wisdom of spiritual leaders. They would now provide avenues and directions for us. If the locus of religious authority had before resided in the four walls of the temple in Jerusalem, now it would reside within the four walls of the yeshiva, the religious academy. More than any other figure, the person that represented this transition in Jewish history was Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai, who lived during the destruction of the temple in 70 CE, the greatest upheaval in Jewish history until those in the last century. No divine guidance, no heavenly voice. Yochanan ben Zakkai escaped Jerusalem under Roman siege and established a tiny rabbinic academy at Yavne, a now post near Gaza Strip, where the Mishnah would later be composed. You know, until the day he died, Yochanan ben Zakkai was unsure if he made the right decision for the Jewish people. He remarks to his students before he dies that he fears whether he be, will be rewarded or punished in the next world. For anyone with the weight of history on their shoulders, no decision is without consequence. In giving up the dream of a restored Jerusalem then, he gave up a hope that was only materialized in the lifetimes of many of us. Did Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai have to do this? While strategically historians in hindsight might say yes, in actuality, we can never really know. And yet at the same time, he paved the path to what is rabbinic Judaism and the next 2000 years of the Jewish story. Jewish history as we know it began at Yavne. Now, why am I telling you this today? Because today we also live in days without precedent. And I'm not only speaking about a recent pandemic. This pandemic is triggering so many other national and international crises and upheavals. An environmental crisis, 
an economic downturn, deep societal injustices and insecurities about the future? How will technology help humanity? And how is technology being used and misused to sow division among us? The world that we lived in 50 years ago is absolutely nothing like the world we live in today. History seems to be moving at an increasingly furious pace. And the question all of us ask is where? Where is history moving? As for the Jewish people, we've also been in a century of revolution. Not since the destruction of the temple has there been such sociological change, religious change, demographic change, occupational change. We have seen the destruction of a major part of world Jewry and its rebirth in the state of Israel. Jews have witnessed demographic shifts like no other people. We have seen radically new ways to access or even understand tradition, even in the past year. What should the role of faith and tradition play in the next century, or dare I say, centuries? What will Judaism and the Jewish people look like 100 years from now? <clears throat> Just like Yochanan ben Zakkai, we don't have a heavenly voice, and yet, we need to take decisive actions based upon our best understanding of what this moment calls from us. We need to look to wise people, to scholars, to help us consider the directions of the Jewish people for the next century or even millennia. What exactly does the present moment call from us? What is the message for us to carry forth in 5781? What are the normative values that should animate our actions at this point in human and Jewish history, both as individuals as well as communities? And this is why we've invited Rabbi Yitz Irving Greenberg, who is one of the Yochanan ben Zakkai's of our generation. Just like Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai, Rabbi Yitz Greenberg has spent his life considering the future of Jewish life on both sides of the Atlantic Ocean and what faith can mean for the world today and into the future. This conversation that we're going to have between Rabbi Yitz Greenberg and Jacob Solomon comes at a time of mashber, which in Hebrew means pitch crisis. However, as many have pointed out, in Hebrew there's another re meaning of mashber. Mashber also means not only crisis, but birthing stool. From crisis, like Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai, we can birth new possibilities for ourselves, and for the world. And may 5781 enable us to birth new dreams within ourselves and to let go of those things which hold us back. Like the blessing that we said on Rosh Hashanah on the apples and honey, Shechadesh Aleinu Shana Tova, we should renew ourselves with a good year. We should renew ourselves in such a way that it's not just a good year, but a Shana Tova, a year punctuated by goodness and not evil. And I'll turn this over to Jacob Solomon to introduce Rabbi Greenberg and to lead our conversation. Shalom. Thanks very much, Rabbi Klein, and congratulations to you for the uh, remarkable work of Mishkan and the Rabbinical Association and the Synagogue Federation Relations Committee. You've, you've given our community a great gift with this 40 Days and 40 Nights program. And uh, I, I have to tell you, uh, I know almost everyone uh, on this call uh, so you, you can probably tell just by looking at me how excited I am to have this opportunity to be uh, in conversation with Rabbi Greenberg. Um, I, I, I know it'll sound gushy and he'll just have to tolerate it, but it's not often that you get to make an introduction of someone who's a personal hero. Uh, you can read the, the details on, on, uh, on the rabbi's website or, or just by Googling him. Um, but he's a rabbi. Rabbi Greenberg is a PhD in American history. He's an author, a philosopher. I think of him as a futurist. He's been a chaplain, a university professor, a, a department head in, in fine universities, a pulpit rabbi, a nonprofit CEO, a foundation president, a great speaker, as you'll hear. Um, mostly, though, he is a serial innovator. Uh, rabbi Greenberg, I uh, just to remind you, I, I suspect that most of you know some of this, was either responsible for or instrumental in bringing us uh, Taglit Birthright Israel, the United States uh, Holocaust Memorial Museum, the National Jewish Center for Learning and Leadership, uh, CLAL, 
uh, and, and, and it goes on. I, I was struck and had forgotten that he was the founder of the Student Struggle for Soviet Jewry in 1964, which was the first national organization uh, uh, bringing to light the, the, the plight of, of our brethren in the former Soviet Union. Um, mostly, first, foremost, and always, he, he is a teacher. Um, and, and I would say, and I don't think it's an overstatement, a transformational uh, teacher. I, I want to just share a, a couple of personal remarks. Um, when, when I first came to Miami in 1981, uh, Rabbi Greenberg already had a deep and an important relationship with our community. Uh, he was uh, the scholar in residence at, at board of directors retreats, uh, countless leadership education programs, um, and those programs ran through the 80s and 90s. I, I, don't, I don't think it's uh, exaggeration to say that his Torah has shaped the trajectory of our Jewish community. He's inspired so many of us over, over now multiple generations of Jewish leaders uh, in, in Miami. Uh, for me personally, it was, it was actually almost 40 years ago that I was invited to a, a two or three day uh, retreat for Jewish communal professionals at Cal uh, in New York City with uh, maybe 10 or 12 other uh, mid-level Jewish professionals. Um, and there was one moment that I want to share with you because it gives you an idea of the impact that, that uh, Rabbi Greenberg has had on, on people. Uh, it was a as I recall, it was a three-hour class entitled God and the Shoah, God and the Holocaust. And it was one of the moments in my life that I can say without exaggeration uh, was transformational. We sat, the, the 10 or so of us, in, in classroom-style desk chairs. Rabbi Greenberg stood in front of the room and spoke in quiet, humble, and searingly honest tones about this incredibly difficult issue. Um, for those three hours, time disappeared. The hours went like seconds. The classroom disappeared. The people around me disappeared. And all that was left was Rabbi Greenberg's voice and his pained and compelling articulation of this impossibly difficult theological question. There aren't too many moments in my life that I would describe as transcendent, and this was certainly one of them. It has been said of him that, that Rabbi Greenberg has given us the vocabulary of contemporary Jewish thinking. And he actually helps us understand where we are in the arc of Jewish history as we adapt, as Rabbi Pine said, to two of the most disruptive upheavals imaginable, the Holocaust and the founding of the modern state of Israel. We are indeed in one of those kinds of moments as we stumble and grope our, our way through this pandemic uh, we feel physically vulnerable by this, this tiny virus that has stopped the world. Um, and, and as Jews during these 10 days of awe, we feel spiritually vulnerable too. Um, so to begin our, our, our program, now that we're 10 or 15 minutes into it already, we've asked Rabbi Greenberg to address himself with, 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 um, with, without hurrying um, to this issue of the theological and spiritual dimensions of, of the pandemic. The, the, the way our, 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 the next hour or so will go is that uh, Rabbi Greenberg will speak to us on, on this topic. Uh, again, I'll remind you to please keep your, your um, microphones on, on mute so that we're not distracted, so that he's not distracted. Um, if you put things in the chat, I think only we will see them. Uh, later on, I will engage in, uh, in conversation with Rabbi Greenberg. Conversation, by the way, means I'm going to be asking him questions and he's going to be answering them. That's the way uh, conversations go, uh, in this case anyway. Um, and uh, then after I raise some topics with him, um, you'll be able to chat any questions or topics that you want to raise uh, with Rabbi Greenberg and they'll get through to me. And as time allows, um, I'll, I'll, I'll pass them along to him in, in the course of, of conversation. Um, Rabbi, on, on this call uh, are exactly the kind of people you've been talking to your entire life. Um, there are lay leaders, there are wonderful donors, there are um, a couple or maybe three handfuls of, of, of wonderful rabbinic leaders. Um, there are federation colleagues and communal professionals. Um, there are friends, but all of us are, are students, especially at, at this moment um, and at this place. So. So we, we, we picked the, the, the theme of the struggle between life and death 
and the commandment that we receive so often during Deuteronomy to live on the side of life, to, to, to choose life and, and to choose goodness. Um, and we've asked you to begin our program today to talk about the struggle of life against death, both in the high holidays and in the time of COVID. So we're really honored and delighted and with great anticipa anticipation, um, um, uh, delighted to turn it over to you, Rabbi. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you so much. I'm really, uh, for those of you, you've all heard that loving introduction, you know, know why Jacob was one of the really precious friends and, and the professionals who was sustained me and enabled the work for many decades. And of course, I'm happy to be back in Miami for the same reason, because after many years away, it was one of the great communities for my work in cloud particularly. I would like to shout out to all my good friends from those days who are on this broadcast, but I guess I'm not allowed to, I can't name you all, but you know who you are and please accept my loving good wishes. Uh, I'm sorry to say to all of you that the COVID prevents me from being with you in person. I am actually in lockdown in Jerusalem uh, at this moment where unfortunately the, the Jewish state is not handling the pandemic very well either. Um, and um, so, but I certainly hope that the next time around I'll be able to come in person. Um, I'll start by saying I just finished a book which has actually been a 10, 11 year project. It's kind of summarizing my lifetime teaching and thinking about Judaism. And the title of the book is The Triumph of Life. And the reason that's the title is because my main point in the book is that Judaism, Jewish religion, is a religion of life and embracing life. As a group, society, in fact, all of humanity, the Torah teaches, are called to what has become known in modern life as tikkun olam. That is to say, to repair and correct the world. So in two ways, to fill it with life, especially life in the most dignified form, the human life, and to uphold and improve society so much that every human being, in fact, every life creature, will receive the proper treatment, the dignity, the help that it's entitled to in daily life, in actual reality. In fact, our religion predicts that if human, not if we asking us when to, because it asks us to do that, to join God in partnership. It's called Brit or Covenant in Jewish tradition. If we will join God in partnership, and of course all the rest of humanity will also join with us, that we will, not that we might, but we will overcome all the enemies of life and of dignity, and that's why we can dream of a repaired world, Tikkun. What does that mean? It means that our task as human beings is to overcome poverty, enemy of a quality of life and of people, hunger, to overcome oppression, it predicts. That means all forms of inequality, of, yes, racism and sexism, anti-Semitism, all forms of mistreating of humans. It predicts that humans will have the capacity to overcome war. And in the prophetic dream, Isaiah particularly, we will overcome the sicknesses, all these forms of sickness that cripple or restrict or reduce human dignity and human capacity. In fact, the prophets predict that we will roll back death, at least in the form of expanding the human lifespan. This is the vision of the Torah, but what's even more impressive it insists this is the calling, this is the purpose, this is the mission of all humans. Now, the Jews, we like to think of ourselves as an avant-garde. I sometimes call it as we're a leading, we're a lead partner in this partnership. But it's alongside all of humanity. And in fact, it is a major contribution of the Jewish religion, Jewish people. This vision that the world can be transformed, that the world can be and will be upgraded in all these ways that I described. Now, just as the Jewish religion dreams and talks of collectively society, humanity, repairing the world and filling it with improved life, 
we are each individually called an individual life to embrace life. The central command of Jewish tradition, I maintain, is to choose life. And that means literally to choose life in every behavior. To go to Deuteronomy for a moment, and Jacob referred to it, Moses at the end of his life summarizes the whole Torah, and this is what he tells them. All these commandments, all these laws, all these stories, what do they add up to? He says as follows, Behold, I put before you today, and of course, he means every day today, I put before you life and good, death and evil, and of course, as he explores that, he also says, choose life. Now, Maimonides pointed out and saw this. Notice how Moses puts the idea before us. They are twinned. On the one hand, there is life and good. They go together. And on the other hand, there is death and evil. They go together. In Maimonides' words, that means every action, every good action in life, there is a choice of life or quality of life as against the alternative of death and degrading life. That is the definition of good. In every act of good, there's an act on the side of life. In fact, the reverse is also true. In every sin, in every act of evil, there is some choice of death or degrading life or minimizing or diluting it. And of course, Moses' summary is the whole Torah is trying to teach you, choose life. Now, again, we have to take this literally, and I think that's the grasp of Judaism that each one of us has to come to understand. It means literally in every moment of your life, in every action that you take, there is an option or there is a choice, even if you're not fully aware of it. So you can't live a kind of a routine or unthinking life. If you will stop and consider it, you will see that in this moment, you can maximize life by what you do, and you can minimize death or God forbid the opposite. Every act, eating, <laughs> it's pretty obvious. If I don't eat, I'm gonna die, we're gonna all die. But if you do eat, what food will you choose to eat? Will it be healthy? Will it be without sugar, <laughs> saturation, low fat? Will it be nutritious? And you've chosen life. If it is saturated fat and salt and sugar and <laughs> junk food, then you've chosen death. Breathing, the next breath you take. If you've polluted the atmosphere, then you will breathe in sickness and a step toward death. If you have worked for clean air and have preserved the climate, then you are breathing for life. The next word you speak, the next word to your friend, to your child, to your lover, to your spouse, it can be a word of encouragement, possibility, take on life, a word of dignity and respect, or it can be a word of dismissal, even degradation. It can be denial or a word of discrimination and put down of other people, other colors, other races, other religions, and that's a choice of death. And literally through every moment of life when you travel, and you drive, do you take public transportation? When you have a choice, can you use an electric car that is less polluting? Do you wear seat belts to protect your life? Do you drive carefully or do you drive recklessly, speedingly and drive people off the road? In each case, at every moment, you're choosing moments of life and embracing life or being responsible for other people's lives or moments of death. And one could go on and on because it implies to developing your mind. The next day, the next week, or the 40 days and 40 nights, you can choose to enrich your mind, your thinking, your spirituality, or you can choose to dumb down and get away from it all and just fill your mind with junk entertainment. And when you work, it can be work that improves the world. You can produce a safe and useful product and pay a fair wage to the workers or you can exploit, or you can cheat the consumer, or you can make schlock that adds to the pollution in the world. In short, in fact, if I had time, I, I don't, I, in the book I argue that every ritual act, not just every ethical and daily act, 
but every ritual act in the Torah is also designed in that particular moment to increase our choice of life, to respect it, to maximize it as against the alternative. Now, having called this as the central responsibility of humans, the tradition also says very honestly, there is a struggle. It's not just that you have to struggle to make the choice between life and death. You can't just act routinely and unthinkingly. The truth is that life itself is full of many pressures and many forces, some of which make naturally for degradation and death, and some of which make naturally for life and for good. Now, all year long, the Torah focuses choosing life, embracing life, doing something that really strengthens the sense of quality of life in your life and others, helping others. On the high holy days, however, tradition has focused us on death. It's very striking because most of the time for Shabbat, you're not even supposed to publicly mourn or deal with death. But here the feeling was exposure for life to death in a moment of enriching and turning people back to life. So Rosh Hashanah, the central image is you're on trial for your life, make aware of the fact that life is limited and vulnerable. And therefore, what does Rosh Hashanah suggest? It's a time for repentance. It's a time to give up habits that are death dealing, that are degrading, that are diluting of the quality of life. It's a time to turn to enrichment of life and to good behavior and to concern for others. So the calling attention to the lifespan is a way of dramatizing and focusing your life, your mind, increasing life in the world and being more responsible for the lives of others. Yom Kippur takes us to the ultimate stage. I've always argued Yom Kippur is really a kind of an experience of death. We might say we're pre-enacting our own death, right? And what does that mean? Well, if you think about Yom Kippur, you don't eat. There's a Jewish definition of death. There's no eating, there's no drinking, there's no washing, there's no sex. That's the Jewish that's the Jewish definition, I guess, of what it means to be dead. In any event, in any event, this is deliberately done so through the ritual and through the experience of confronting death. Why? Because suddenly you appreciate life. It's like when you had a narrow escape or from an accident. You come out, you suddenly realize life is so beautiful. Life is so short and how much rich and wonderful things there are in it that you want to get to before you blur it all away. So this whole experience of confronting um, bad habits, of confronting the shortness of life, is designed to give us the strength to utz us, to give us the injection of energy and determination that we're going to respond by affirming life, that we realize we have to choose, we have to fight for it, we have to work for it, and that's what it's trying to do. Now, obviously, this background I give you because we are facing this pandemic, this year world. <laughs> All human beings are facing COVID-19. Over 31 million cases, and worldwide we're approaching 1 million dead, which is devastating. In the United States, approaching over 200,000. Again, these are devastating numbers. Worse than civil war, worse than... I saw recently an article that argued this is the equivalent of 9-11, 67, 70 days in a row. Now, the point is that the pandemic is the enemy of all our values, not only because it makes death and threatens life, because it pushes millions back into poverty. The economic dislocation and the need to close down has pushed literally tens of millions of people, and the most poor, the most vulnerable in society particularly, back into poverty. It also targets older people and medically vulnerable people, the people who we are called upon the Torah to show extra concern and extra protection for, and yet it targets them ruthlessly and blindly. So how do you react? My answer is that the Jewish tradition has said this all along. Life is a struggle and there are forces of death. The answer is you react to increased threat and attack from death by choosing life and by fighting back. That means that the true religious response to the pandemic is to invest, 
to develop in the vaccines and the cures, that the scientists on that frontier are in fact the angels, if you will, the messengers of God at this moment, fighting for life. It means that we have to look back now and change by our investment in upgrading the health system, which has been neglected or relatively neglected, both in Israel and America in past decades. It also means that each individual has to take those acts that choose life in the next minute. I mean by that, of course, fighting back against death by wearing masks to stop the transmission, by washing the hands and avoiding handshaking, by social distancing, which is painful and difficult and isolating, but yet it's a statement of choosing life. So normally to kiss and hug this person would have been the true expression of my love. Now if I love them, I will keep that distance and I will control myself. So this is not a rejection this is, of course, the specifics of choosing life and making each action consciously. So now people are tired, people are annoyed, people are frustrated, people say there's inconsistency here. But the answer Judaism says is no, this is a religious discipline. And it has to be done with the same rigor, the same responsibility, the same reliability, day in, day out, as prayer or as any act of religious act, as, as eating matzah on Passover. This responsibility to choose life is really, and it should be, more capable in our tradition because people know this has been the demand all along. And those, I would argue, religiously blind of maybe at this point fools who have responded to this by saying, no, you can ignore it because God will protect us because we're devout and religious. It's really a form of magical thinking that abuses the tradition and fails, goes the opposite. In the 19th century, Rabbi Israel Salanter, the great rabbi in the 19th century, Vilna in Lithuania, there was a cholera epidemic in 1848. And Salanter got up and said, the doctors told him that that particular cholera epidemic was so vicious that in their judgment, people should not fast because they would be vulnerable and they should not collectively gather anywhere because the transmission that spreads in crowds. And therefore, Salanter got up and announced that the Jewish people of Ilma should collectively break the fast, that it's a mitzvah to make Kiddush and to eat. He said they should cut the prayers drastically short and spend the time walking, because as he said, in a time of the crisis, not just a question of life saving, in a time of such medical crisis, he said, Obeying the doctor's instructions, obeying the best scientific judgment as to what protects life, that's the religious obligation. That's the word of God. That's the commandment of God. And of course, I would add to this, only we as a people particularly will remember that the lesson of the Shoah and of Israel that Jacob referred to, namely that when death intensifies, when you have mass killing or mass death, then the proper response is not just simply to go on with life, but to intensify life. And that's why the catastrophe of the Shavuah was responded to by the Jewish people, by its incredible outburst of life in creating the state of Israel, and no less important in reviving and renewing Jewish life in America. So to make a long story short, my point is the two, the, the, there's one the more step that the tradition calls for in the face of, of this pandemic, as I said, one is to develop the cures, and secondly, the actions that prevent this transmission, and thirdly, the solidarity, to look out for the vulnerable, to the shut-ins, to bring help and the errands for those who are needy or are cut off. This combination of the three actions represents the truly appropriate religious response. Now, again, I understand this is hard. It's isolating. There is a sense of fear. You have a target on your back. But again, my answer is, this is the time to step up. This is the, the Jewish message all along. The Judaism has the divine promise that if you step up, life will win out over death. To quote the Song of Songs, love is stronger than death. And it's this generation's battle that we have to do together, not to be intimidated, but to have the courage to believe that if we do our share, six months from now, a year from now, I believe in short and not long-term alone, 
we will have developed the protection and the capacity to live life, even if it's only in tension with this pandemic. In short, this is a moment to rise to the command and to the finest expression of the, the Jewish commitment to choose life. Shkach, Rabbi, that was, that was really wonderful and a, a great a great opening to a, to a conversation that I think many of us, many of us are really yearning uh, to, to have and, and your words uh, were like do as they as they say in in uh, in, in our Torah and 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 very very nurturing. I I, I, I you asked me uh, what in our preparation for the call you thought it might be useful to give a quick overview of what we're doing in the community and I, I certainly could do that and and uh, and I will in 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 short order but I I um I often think about the the. the the uh, C. Wright Mills concept of a sociological imagination when things are both big issues but also private problems. And, and, and you spoke, I, I think, very movingly about the central obligation of being human, which is to choose life. And, and, and in the aggregate, those individual choices will create a, a more just and a, and a healthier society. But I wonder, before I get into what, what we're doing in response to the crisis here, I wonder if you would put on your chaplain's hat uh, a little bit. And instead of talking about the public issue, talk talk about the private, uh, sorry, the, the, the personal pain that so many people are feeling, whether they've lost people. I know you had a, a frightening uh, encounter with COVID uh, yourself and, and your family, and thank God you're okay. Um, but what do you say to people who are confronting uh, endless loss, or 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 the enormous fear of putting themselves out in 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 harm's way, or or really what might even be worse of all the uncertainty. Um, you know, I know there are strands in our Jewish DNA that help us deal with uncertainty. Um, but how would you, as as a as a rabbinic handholder, um, comfort people, and and what would you say to them in your chaplain mode? It's an excellent point. And of course, again, the honest answer is the losses for those who have lost or those who have lived through and survived but had very bad experiences, they're quite devastating. And, and I, part of the answer is I don't have a quick solution for it or a quick cure, except again, maybe just being there for them, holding their hands, standing with them. I think that's part of how we all have to respond to people who have felt this loss. Secondly, I have to say, we should allow, I want to encourage as a rabbi, again, it's, I don't usually invoke this, but the truth is, this is one of the great promises of Jewish tradition, which rabbis don't talk about much, but I think really this is a moment to draw upon it and trust that the Bible, the whole tradition insists that you're not alone, that at this moment, you are always with God and God is with you. Uh, it means you know, the famous line, though I walk in the valley of the shadow of death, I shall not fear you are with me. It doesn't mean the magic that I have a bullet, that will, magic bullet that will protect me. It doesn't mean that. What it means is that I'm not alone, that I'm important, my precious and essence of life and those who I love are with me and are sustained by God who has sustained us for thousands of years without guaranteeing that this particular moment is going to save the day or protect me from it. I would also add, uh, you know, again, it's just a question of listening to the promise and feeling that confidence that God loves you, God shares your pain, God shares your joy. There's a, 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 I said this morning's prayers from the Psalms, when my legs weaken and I feel I'm going to fall, your covenantal love sustains me and lifts me up. So to listen, to read some of those verses and to try to listen and accept them and sustaining them. I would say the second element is what I'm hoping to hear from you, that the community is not going to we view it's going to take care of you and look after you. And this is a reward for being part of a community and of a family. It's one of the strengths of our religion. Great of living life, you have to, to live life, you have to take on risk. Before we got to the pandemic, when you love happens, what it means at that moment is that you have taken on an incredible risk. What if that person dies? What if that person hurts, disappoints? The answer is, if you were playing it smart, you wouldn't have children, you wouldn't get, you wouldn't have love, you were playing it safe and shrewdly. But in fact, you know the deeper truth that the joy of life, the full, the deepness of life comes from those choices. So my answer again is 
exactly the same answer. Take the risk, make the choice, intensify, make it worthwhile. I always say, you should live so much that if God forbid this happened to you, you would feel it was worth it for what you lived and what you accomplished. And then, and then the rest is just living with faith. Beautiful. Thank, thank you. I, I remember learning from you that the um, a part of the radical assertion of life that uh, victims of the Holocaust um, expressed was that the birth rate. I remember you saying in the in the DP camps was the highest in history. Thank um, you for remembering that. It was the highest in the world at that time. And again, right. it was clear people would. By the way, it turns out it's not just the Jewish response. I read, later, later discovered many decades later that there's a statistic that all over the world, that after war, there is a birth boom in that country. Again, because people feel, and they, it's part of it is they feel the loss. We feel what was taken from us. And the only way you can respond is to recreate life. And it's, uh, I think that is in fact what makes us human and gives us the strength to go on after great tragedy. So if, if they, in, in, after experiencing what they did in horrific uh, circumstances, were able to choose life, that's, that's an inspiring message. I, I, I also want to add, because your, 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 your uh, rabbinic humility probably um, didn't allow you to, but I, I also think that the rabbis, uh, certainly the rabbis that, that we know in Miami are, are just all over the place, falling all over themselves to to be supportive, to help congregants, to help people, um, to to show them the verses in the Psalms that you re re referred to, and and uh, you know just just uh, I just want to say to our rabbinic colleagues how how much um, all of us at Federation respect and admire and thank them for their their work. Uh, watching what the rabbis went through to make high holidays available to everyone in the community this season has been absolutely uh, in inspiring. So uh, don't forget to use, uh, to use uh, rabbis as, as, as a resource in addition to those, those beautiful words that Rabbi Greenberg shared. Uh, our, our community, you'll, you won't be surprised, at, but you'll be proud to know that our community really has responded beautifully, Rabbi. We, we um, in addition to the obvious things of, 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 of of, of uh, making emergency grants to our agencies and seeing to it that people had food and and um, and and uh, providing interest-free loans and emergency grants, uh, you know the things that you would expect any responsible and compassionate community to to uh, provide. Um, what's really inspired me has been the way everyone's been working together, um, and it's. I think I think we've uh, deployed over 1,200 people volunteering, um, you know, putting themselves, as I said before, in harm's way, and and who are um, out there working at the kosher food bank or putting food packages in people's trunks. We've had multiple kosher food distribution events. Um, I, I think it's 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 safe to say that that uh, that if we know about a Jew in need in Miami, we're uh, doing everything possible to meet to meet those needs, and and especially the ones that are life saving. And uh, as as you said, uh, clearly isolation and, and loneliness and and uh, sense of alienation is is a, is a really important uh, piece of this that we're that we're trying to um, that we're that we're trying to deal with uh, uh, as well. Um, as as you think about the uh, the pandemic and its effect on on American Jewry. I, I, I said in my introduction, I think of you both as a historian and a futurist. Uh, I wonder if you might, um, you know, just just give yourself over to thinking out loud about what you think the American Jewish community is gonna look like um, in five or 10 or, or 20 years uh, as a result of the disruption of, 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 the, of, of this pandemic. And, and I, I know it's, um, Predicting the future isn't isn't something that that you signed up for, but I, I think your perspective would be really really useful. So first of all, thank you again for sharing those wonderful acknowledgments about the rabbi's role. I was thinking, as you said, to me, whenever whenever I was going on a danger or difficult trip or or in moments of difficulty and danger, my father used to come in and bless me with this verse, Ki He would say. He actually said it to me every Friday night. 
God's angels, may God will command his angels to look out for you and escort you and protect you on your way. Now, the, the, the catch there is who are these angels? It's not these heavenly be creatures with wings and so on. And Salvation, Rabbi Salvation points out that the word malach also means messengers, God's messengers. So the messengers are really these human, not just the rabbis, but also the lay people who we have described so beautifully as volunteering and as helping and as maybe others. So the answer is these are the angels, and I really believe that it, these are the angels that do miracles or that at least hold and strengthen our life. Now, what about the general broader issue of what will the Jewish regime look like after the pandemic? So I would, I would separate it in two ways. I think there's an immediate crisis, and I am concerned about it too. For example, again, the, 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 the total crash and then being able to get together has threatened the existence of community centers and of other organizations that depend on tuition and participation in order to fund themselves. And it's a real crisis, and the, the COVID does not distinguish. <laughs> So it's, it's a threat to every existence. And it's also a threat, I think, to the more vulnerable, to the newer startups, many of which I think are critical for the frontiers of Jewish life. And yet they're vulnerable financially and not as well established. They don't have, they don't have um, endowments and so on. And I was very relieved and excited to see that the Jewish community in America had created or major foundations got together with the Jewish federations to create this community relief and fund to protect and try to help uh, those organizations that are vulnerable right now. And I regret to say, I'm sure that we will lose, including some precious and valuable ones in this period. But again, a community that is alert, that is responsive like it is, that is taking responsibility collectively, I think will reduce or minimize that damage. Jewish life uh, has never been a bed of roses and we've had serious setbacks in the past. Our secret is not that we never have failed or never never were defeated or never set back. The greatness of the Jewish people is that we always came back. Second route, the second round, the the second effort, the, the not giving in to defeat. So I, I feel the same way about this moment. I think there will be a, less victims or less holes in the fabric of the community thanks to the community's response, but there will be some. We'll just have to rebuild and remake it afterward. I think the Longer term issue, longer term issue is the uh, what will happen after the pandemic. And here again, I'm an optimist, and maybe I'm mistaken. I I do believe that we will come up with a vaccine and a cure, if not in one year, in two years, in three years. And therefore, I feel if we get through this narrow straits, if we get through this temporary but real crisis of breakdown and disaster, then I think we will be able to go into a much broader challenge. And the broader challenge, I'll come back to it maybe later, but I'll say it right now. I still say the main challenge of Jewish life in diaspora, particularly in America, is the challenge of developing a Jewish identity and a Jewish culture that's so rich that it can exist and in fact flourish in this free and open and welcoming society. Despite the upsurge of anti-Semitism, America and much of the diaspora is so open to Jews and so accepting that we have this other crisis that our, our community, our culture, our religion was not prepared for total acceptance. It's a very sad, you know, during the exile. So part of the hatred and the anti-Semitism and the discrimination, part of the effect was to stiffen our back and to make us committed and make us feel these people are inferior, they're degraded types. So why would I want to give up my type and join but in America, thank God, and in much of the diaspora now, society is open, welcoming, treat Jews with respect. Jews, you saw that statistic a year or two ago, the Jews were the most respected minority in this country. People looked up to it. Well, under those circumstances, again, the only way Judaism will maintain itself is if we develop such a rich, personal Jewish life and experience, such a deeper understanding of Jewish tradition and values that I feel knowing how good and how wonderful and how like us the rest of the society is, I still choose to be distinctively Jewish. And again, in all bluntness, I think the most successful groups in the last two decades have been those who have gone into shelter, into some form of separation, some form of, of um, ghetto, if you will, 
but I think that's a temporary and a mistaken solution. The ultimate solution is not that. I think the Torah has the greatness, and this is our calling, to develop such richness and such power that we would choose it in the full presence of most wonderful set of alternative values. So uh, that, honestly, that challenge is unmet. I'm worried about it because the Pew study of two years ago suggested that we're about to have a major drop demographically in the center of Jewish life and the least or the semi-affiliated and in the center of Jewish life. So I think we have to make a major new reinvestment in Jewish living. What Klal tried to do with the federations in the 70s and 80s, Jewish leadership learning, Jewish religious experiences, we have to double and triple, quadruple that. And I believe that Birthright Israel, at every, or the goal at least, the option is that every Jew in the teenage years, college years, will experience Israel firsthand. Well, I think we have to do the equivalent down, up and down the line in American life. For example, again, I've argued we should provide a universal, uh, universal retreat. I believe the retreat is the most powerful experience we have of intensive Jewish living that really changes people's lives. I think we should be offering literally a gift as Birthright Israel of a universal retreat. I, I, my book is in part written for that idea in three or four days to get the narrative, to get the values and the narratives of Judaism, and maybe some workshops on how do you turn this into your family life and personal life. I think that is the kind of unmet challenge or yet to be met challenge in front of us. Again, I'm a chronic optimist. It's in part because the Jewish religion is optimistic. It claims in the end, the good guys will win. That the Messiah will come, that will, we will perfect the world. So I believe that it, the community will rise to the occasion, but it's going to be a major effort to do that, to develop intellectually, spiritually, experientially. So I look forward to that challenge. I, once the, what, has, what the pandemic will not be the top problem, but will be either a, a doable or soluble problem, and, and the big problem will come ahead of us. So uh, just to digress a second, um, one, of, one of our uh, audience members asked, um, about your book, so you just mentioned it. What, what's the name of it, and when can we uh, when can we uh, get a hold of it? God bless you for asking that question. <laughs> the name of it is the Triumph of Life. That's the good news. And again, because of my claim that Judaism really believes that life will win out, and in this world, not just in individual cases. The bad news is that I don't have a publisher yet. I just sent it to my agent, who has just begun to send it out to the publishers. So. Stay tuned. I hope sometime in the near future we'll get a, a name of a publisher and maybe a, a, a publication date. Hopefully not too far off. I'm, sh I'm sure you're well in about all of two years since the last book, so I'm sure you're, you're due and uh, we'll look forward to seeing it. So you, I often quote you, I, I hope accurately, um, as, as you warned against um, a sense of triumphalism that, that some of our religious streams occasionally engage in. And, and you said, I hope, that I don't care what denomination a person belongs to so long as they're ashamed of it. And I, if you didn't say it, you should have because it's a great line. Um, but I wonder, not the negative part, but I wonder if you could talk about the assets that our screens bring to creating a future that is thick with identity and Jewish culture. That's a very important point, by the way. <laughs> as uh, my, it, it was a true joke, it's a true story. The, 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 it's, again, after the show, when you look back at the religious streams, neither during, neither before, during, or even after, did any of the streams have some appropriate or correct way of responding. And so my reaction was, you should all be embarrassed, you should all be ashamed. So my joke was, of course, it doesn't really so matter in the end which one you are, as long as you're ashamed of it. But I want to add that I, that was meant with humor and, and that I'm proud to be ashamed of. Well, I'll tell you an actual real story. I spoke at the Rabbinical Council of America, the Orthodox Rabbis group, when they made this pitch and the whole plea that in light of the Holocaust, the truth is that their attitude toward non-Orthodox Red Jews should be much more respectful, which we pluralist, we should treat them as equal. So when he got up, he was very angry at the idea that I'm saying that they're all equal and they're all legitimate. So he yelled at me, he said, well, if you think 
that that's true. Why are you an Orthodox rabbi if you think they're all equal or they're all valid? So I looked at him and I said, because that's the group I'm most ashamed of. <laughs> uh, anyway, my, my point is yes. In other words, if you look about it, each group has tremendous strengths and particular strengths. And as a member of that group, I should be aware of that. On the other hand, I should be ashamed, meaning I should recognize what it doesn't have and how much you can learn from the others. Looking back, why am I a pluralist? Aside from the fact that in the Holocaust, we're all the same. And aside from the fact that in building Israel, every type of Jew was a major participant. Putting that aside, it's a simple fact. In dealing with modernity and the opportunities of modernity, there was no one solution. And the truth is each one has had shown strength and each one has shown weaknesses in dealing with it. The orthodox strength, particularly the Haredi, the more traditional version, which has done better in the last two decades. Uh, Salvin was by exclusion, by keeping out modernity, by, by minimizing or by creating shelters, a ghetto, geographic, spiritual, and educational. And so, yes, I understand that because no religion was probably prepared for full choice. And therefore, the more exposed you are to choice, the more vulnerable you are. But, uh, but that exclusion and that narrowing, if you stay there, that way, in my judgment, number one, is it turns off a lot of Jews. The bulk of Jews feel this is a good society, a good country, an outstanding culture. And they're not going to give it up. Uh, they, they'll, they'll demand a version of Judaism that can live in that culture. Number two, bluntly, I think the shelter is a very vulnerable and fleeting shelter. And I believe as internet and as the media and as this culture becomes more and more present, that it won't work that way. It'll have to go the other way to play in the major leagues and to have a high level enough. So I think that is my answer to that question. Now, as far as looking back, Reform's great strength was they were quicker to understand the need for change. They were quicker to recognize the moral values of a new culture, which would improve or bring us closer to our own best ideals, respect for Gentiles or women's equality and so on. That was a major contribution. Reform's weakness, of course, is that it became more and more so identified with those values that it had trouble keeping up a richer or deeper Jewish living pattern, and therefore they were more vulnerable to assimilation. And, and conservative Jews, and modern Orthodox Jews for that matter, had the strength of knowing that you do bring the tradition with you. You try to live the tradition, but you'll have to make changes and you'll have to incorporate some of the best insight. That was a major also insight and contribution that you have tradition and change. Their weakness, again, was not deeply enough either taking the modern culture and its challenges and insights to the best levels. Uh, and, and their weakness also was that the tradition itself was not lived dynamically. In many cases, you live it as the tradition instead of as renewed. Uh, the obvious example I tell people is, as Passover is such a central holiday to the Jewish people, Yom Atzmoed, Israel Independence Day, is no less an exodus. As many people, more people, were saved from Europe and from the rest of the world and brought to Israel in this exodus than actually than the, those who left Egypt. So, it sh but but we haven't yet created this holiday as dynamically and as centrally in our lives. So that's a major challenge for modern and conservative Jews to to develop the tradition in a more dynamic and applied fashion, and so on. And one can go down the line. My my point is that the wisest thing in a freedom society. It's not going to be one way. Even if it's right, it doesn't matter. Even if it's the word of God, it doesn't matter. Because that's the essence of freedom that ch Jews will have a choice. In fact, you know, my old joke again, that every Jew will become a Jew by choice sooner or later. And you have to equip yourself. The rabbis understood after the destruction of the temple that the Jews are going to be in exile. They need a higher level of Jewish learning, a higher level of Jewish experience in order to maintain themselves. Well, I think we're going to have to repeat that in new levels and with new experiences <laughs> and new observances and new cultural experiences and retreats and things that the rabbis didn't do. That That's our job. And I, I believe we can do it. And if we do it, it'll be a Judaism of freedom, Judaism of affluence used well, a freedom of choice. I'd like to believe that that's the highest level and that God in the end wants free participation in this partnership not coerced, not discriminated, and pushed into the corner. 
So mm -hmm. I think it's a privilege to be alive at such a time and to face this challenge. Thank you. That's that's really that's really wonderful. Uh, I, I I know that your the 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 the, the, the animating spirit of Clau, uh I think. I think it's it's uh, accurate to say was situated in your notion that we are in um, since uh, since the Shoah and since the founding of the modern state of Israel in the a third era of, of of Jewish history. One in which, uh, if the first era was biblical and the second um, was, was rabbinic, uh, that we're in a third era in which the rabbi's role is to lead us. Um, the, the laity uh, to be role models of, of, of Jewish life and to demonstrate uh, not, not just the responsibility part of it, but also the, the enormous joy and celebratory quotient that, that's entailed in living a, a Jewish life. Um, I, I think about that. Um, and then on the other hand, I read in Dvarim about the, the dire prediction that Moses says, you know, that you're going to you're going to build your fine houses, and you're you're going to your flocks and your herds are going to increase, and and you're going to forget where all of this comes from, and you're going to think that it was because of your cleverness and your your resources that that you've been successful. How, how are we doing against that uh, against that prophecy, Rabbi? Are we are we uh, forgetting? Are we remembering? Um, how, give us give us some honest feedback. Jacob, if I didn't love you before, <laughs> I'd love you just remembering the three stages and the point, because that is one of the central fe features of the book. Um, not only my claim that we've had um, biblical Judaism followed by rabbinic Judaism, but now we are on the brink of lay Judaism. And you, you see it happening in front of us at this moment. I mean, the, the main decisions of the Jewish people are being made by lay people not just in obvious cases in Israel and the Knesset or the IDF's chief of command and so on, but really throughout the world. And I mean, this not sarcastic, but what you, what you quoted me as saying is correct. I told the, what the rabbi said, what do I do if, if we're entering a secular age and the rabbis are not gonna be the official leaders anymore, what do I do? I say, become a rabbi's rabbi. The lay people are gonna be a rabbi but you can become their rabbi, become a resource, become an educator, become an inspiration, a role model. And of course, then your influence can be much greater than in the old days when they were taught that they, you are the authority and they have to obey whatever you say. I don't think that that is going to be the future. So again, the further implication of the three stages, by the way, number one is that this is what the book stresses. This is what God wants. This is not just sociology. In other words, the Bible and the rabbis describe how God self-limits that tremendous unlimited divine power is deliberately restricted. That's what the common breed is about. God says, I'm not going to do it all. You could become a partner. And the rabbis said in their time, God said, I'm going to do less, less control of history, less control of the outcome, because you're more responsible. And by the way, the rabbi said in their time, the destruction of the temple was because the people were not responsible. And the people failed. So that could happen. So again, I want to stress number one is that in this third stage, it's a tremendous opportunity and responsibility, but it can easily be blown. I'm not denying that. Nevertheless, when you come back to the specifics of it, the implication, again, from the rabbi's model, the Torah has a limited number of act religious activities, and many of them are centered on the temple. The rabbi said, God is more hidden. We are more responsible. Bring it into the home. Bring it into the kosher kitchen, bring it into, into the uh, bedroom, the way you make love and the way you treat people, bring it into the workplace. And so they expanded religious calling. Now I'm arguing exactly, we're living in a time of God's total hiddenness. Humans are fully responsible. The tragedy of the Holocaust, I look back now, is because God was not intervened this way anymore with miracles to save the day, but God works totally through human agents in this case, the human agents, and that means not just the Nazis who were evil, it means that the neighbors, the bystanders who participated or who collaborated, or, and frankly, the allies who failed to act, they led to this catastrophe. And the state of Israel represents our commitment that we're taking power and we will be responsible. We will protect Jews, and not just protect Jews, we'll build a society that's a model for the people. So I see an expansion of halacha, if you will, that breaks the religious lines, reform, conservative, orthodox. 
I think the universal obligation, how do you drive, what's your carbon footprint, those, those are halachic commandments that I think every Jew will practice and they will cross all existing lines. I'm, I'm guessing that within a century, the present denominational lines will be, will be much less if at all present. Because why? Because we're moving from modernity, which I believe the Shoah and Israel bring to an end in its dominance, into post-modernity. And I think the whole world, not just us, is moving there in part because of the feeling that the Holocaust shows the failures, despite its great accomplishments of modernity. So we're moving into that new phase. And yes, we're creating it together, but I, I believe it will take the form of a more universal practice, of a more universal activity of holiness in secular activity, and so on. And that's part of the creativity that we have to bring to the table right now. And yes, I do believe that the Jewish Federation, the social welfare responsibility, that the mutual accountability, for, there is the protection of the state of Israel and vice versa. These are the frontiers of the holiness, which is not finished. I think it has to be expanded literally in every personal way, in every business, in every workshop, as well as in every organization. So it becomes not just a, a giving social welfare, it becomes an educational religious experience. That's again, a part of the agenda that I think we are privileged to be able to create together. Beautiful. It's kind of evocative of the uh, Rob Cook line about making the old new and the new holy, uh, the, to bring holiness right. into what we do as, as part of our... I, I, let me be admonished, we may blow it. And the truth is there has been a much higher level of assimilation and of intermarriage and so on than I imagined when I started Klal and that I was projecting and I was really driven by this fear that it's going to happen. So I'm not saying it's going to be easy. Uh, because why? Because we improved our game and we did develop more Jewish resources, but the uh, the outside alternatives improved even more dramatically and we didn't keep up. So uh, the job is by far unfinished and by far uncertain as to the final outcome. But again, uh, look at the past history. The fact is that the people came up with, and the rabbis came up with, and the, and the whole people came up with the new developments. And we're seeing in each place we're seeing in groups, we're seeing in vital synagogues and communities, we're seeing in new startup developments, we're seeing, you know, some of the schools, we're seeing these kinds of breakthroughs. And typically now they're small, maybe a small part of the larger sector. Nevertheless, that's already a sign that we have the potential. And it may be, uh, God forbid, but it could be that you will lose large chunks of people. But the hardcore, the successfully transformed core, I think will then be the basis of a rebuilding. So I'd like to go by take as many with us as we possibly can, but that will really depend on our reaching out. And again, I call upon all the denominations. I say, to the extent that any group is doing better, they should use their strength to reach out and connect to other Jews to the extent that they can learn and improve based on what the other denomination is doing that they're not doing that's the calling of the hour to do it. Right. I think we're uh, we're probably doing better on the tikkun olam part than on the b'malchut shaddai part. The, we're doing good on the on the social justice work and the and the the uh, provision of, of help for people who need it. Uh, a bit less so in terms of remembering that that's part of a covenantal relationship with with God. I want to ask you to um, to turn your attention to uh, the. One, one of the, uh, we have so many, unfortunately, these days, but one of the pressing social issues um, that uh, we're dealing with, uh, certainly in the United States, but I think it's, it's extending beyond the United States as well, and that's the, the, the civil unrest uh, that, that, uh, that we're seeing on the streets of our cities uh, it, with respect to uh, dealing with uh, what many consider to be systemic racism, income inequality, uh, some of the issues that, uh, as Jews, we've historically been very concerned about because they relate to human dignity and justice for all, for all human beings. Um, and so I think our DNA draws us to the issue in a sympathetic way. And then sometimes we confront what's a small but a vocal minority of people associated with those movements who are anti-Semitic uh, or certainly anti-Zionist and, and we're confronted with a real tension 
uh, between wanting to be supportive and, and uh, endorsing the values, the human values associated with the, with the Black Lives Matter movement, for instance, and on the other hand, wanting to protect ourselves and, and to acknowledge that there are those within those movements that, that um, don't feel kindly to us and in fact would, might well do us harm. Um, and so I wonder if you could help us uh, navigate that, that tension and, and, and share your thoughts on it. Look, the, I, I'll start by saying I consider this the most fundamental teaching of my whole life. The Talmud says this is the underlying, the great principle, the fundamental principle of the whole Torah, which all Jewish observance is based, is the statement or the belief that a human being is created in the image of God. And the Talmud explains the human being, every human being is a child of Adam. Every human being is created in the image of God. And the Talmud explains that means that every image of God has, is born with and is entitled to three intrinsic dignities. One is infinite value. Their life is worth more than money. And no amount of money should be short or should be held back to save a life or to, or to uh, or restore the full dignity of a person which means, frankly, that in, in America where you don't have medical insurance for the poor, that's a violation of that fundamental dignity um, because they can't afford a doctor and because they wait longer and because they die in higher rates. Secondly, the second dignity of image of God is equality. There is no preferred image of God. It's a form of idolatry to say that a man is superior to a woman, that a white is superior to a black, that a colored person is somehow more or less inferior to the other people. These are, these are violations of the image of God. And finally, that each human being is unique, they're irreplaceable, and they should be treated accordingly. Now, I start with that. And I want to say, for many immigrants to America, including Jews, the United States democracy gave them opportunity to attain these kind of dignities and values. And one should not forget that. But it's also true that particularly for people of color, African Americans in particular, and indigenous native Indians and so on, that they were denied this equality. They were not given the value that they were not only in slavery in a certain point or genocide in the case of Indians, but that they afterward were held back and discriminated against with Jim Crow. We still have systemic race. So the answer is that this movement unleashed by the Floyd murder or other such terrible incidents we should support it. We know firsthand as Jews discrimination, the famous line in the Torah, you know the soul of the outsider, you have a special feeling for them because you were outsiders in the land of Egypt. So of course, having said that, looting, violence, abuses of this sort are not justified by the mistreatment of discrimination. And the main victims of the looting, as far as I can see from the papers, in fact, are typically immigrant, people of color, owners of small stores, and so on. Either way, the point is we as Jews, therefore, support police reform desperately needed, not stopping or defunding police or things of that sort. Similarly, we condemn looting unqualifiedly. The, the danger of, and I'll get to the anti-Semitism in a minute, the danger of ignoring misbehavior on the part of oppressed people is that the end up, you undermine justice for all. Leviticus 19 has a very powerful and marvelous verse. It's verse 15. Do no unrighteousness, do no injustice in legal cases. Do not give favoritism to the poor. Do not give special status to the rich. Judge your neighbor righteously. Again, it's true. In fact, in America, it's probably the more universal problem that the rich get better treatment because they have better lawyers, whatever. But it's also true that there's a whole school of thought that is basically saying that if the poor, you're poor or oppressed, you are not to be held to legal or moral standards. This was a mistake that was made after the war, World War II, with the colonial freedom of the, co the colonies. They ended up with dictators and abuses that were worse than they had before. Because people said they suffered so much or the people of color, therefore you cannot judge them, they can do no wrong, you can't hold them to just standards. But this corrupts, it corrupts those people, it corrupts the, the victims, they become victims of the same thing too, and of course in the end it leads 
to backlash and rejection and all sorts of other and all sorts of other um, um, abuses that in the end defeat the very cause that you're trying to help by saying don't judge them. So the answer is we have to speak up and hold them accountable. And the same holds true anti-Semitism. First of all, that's a new form of hatred and discrimination, which violates the whole point of human rights and equality, which the movements are pushing for. So of course, number one. And number two is that we, because we're more active and because we're involved, it's all the more important that we speak up and say that. Just say simply, it's Judaism believes that human self-interest is one of the most valid and legitimate forms of behavior. It's, it's legitimate. But then you have a right to speak up and say, you are violating my dignity, my interests. Or if you're telling me that, as a, that I can't, you're anti-Zionist and BDS, you're trying to undermine the state of Israel. The answer is that you're telling me that the Jewish people as a people are not entitled to their own government, their own country not entitled to their own country, that's a form of anti-Semitism right then and there, not to mention the gross distortions about Israel and about the Jewish behavior and the conspiracy theories. So the answer is we have to speak up, and we have to speak up not just to white supremacists and not just to the wealthy or powerful who are, who are discriminating, but against, yes, against the, the poor, against the, those who are oppressed, who are oppressed, when they have gone this way, it, in the end, it reminds me of what happened with Martin Luther King. Martin Luther King was, of course, a great, great moral inspiration to the whole country, not just the blacks. But it, Martin Luther King was not only a strong Zionist and defended the Jewish right to have their own country. More important is Martin Luther King insisted just what I'm saying, that we have to all be held by the standards of justice and not, not to get away with in the name of this. Of course, King was rejected by the radicals, black nationalism, black power, who in the end came out with forms of discrimination against whites or became violent and against the law. And of course, at the end, it not only, it not only hurt uh, the people who were victims of this, it hurt the whole movement, the whole human rights were set back for decades. So I think our failure to speak up now and to push this, so again, it's a challenge of Jew, but I mean, we should have that capacity to balance the universal and the particular, to embrace humanity because it is humanity, but at the same time to look out for all humanity, one step, one person, one family at a time, and it starts with your own family. And if we do that, we will help do the, a favor, not just to ourselves, but to the Black Lives Matter and to every other movement that seeks to restore the dignity of the open. Thank you. Yeah, I, I have to tell you, uh, I've been very heartened by uh, the response that we get as we engage in the leadership of African American community and their organizations. Um, uh, they are um, they're receptive to our concerns. Uh, they share them. Uh, they understand that hatred of one group is is the same as hatred of any group. That 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 all of it is is an affront to the divine image in which we're created. Um, what I try to encourage people to remember is that if you're not in relationship with them, you can't advocate for yourself. You can't, you can't help them understand our point of view, which is uh, what, what we clearly uh, need to do. Um, we're, we're actually, believe it or not, the time has gone by so quickly, but maybe in, in, a, in a few minutes, what, what is your, you talked about BDS and, 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 and Israel. Um, Miami is, is <laughs> such a wonderful community. Our young adults love Israel. We, we have, uh, very strong support for Israel, bipartisan support, young, old, in between. Um, but we're not uh, blind to what's going on in the rest of the country, and we share a collective concern for the rising generations and their connection to Israel, their connection to Jewish peoplehood, their connection to that, that notion of a thick Jewish identity. What's, what's your sense of, 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 of the millennial generation? Uh, how, how, how concerned are you? What do you think some strategies might be to ad advance where we want to go? So let me just say again, American Jews are overwhelmingly 80 plus percent, you know, universal liberals. And that's something I, I, you know, I think one has to respect and an honor, agree with, even if one doesn't agree with it. Uh, but on the left, in particular, in recent years, there's been the growth of radical groups that have turned against Israel, are trying to separate Israel and diaspora, trying to push Zionism out of the progressive camp. 
but I think these are radicals. I think they're wrong. I think they are, they themselves reflect, if not anti-Semitism, which they many times do, but also they reflect something else. I think a kind of a, an exaggerated response that says, you know, that the oppressed are automatically pure and correct. And anybody who's established or well is in America. So for example, again, how do you judge America? To deny the uh, um, discrimination and the terrible history, systemic racism is false. But to deny the America to say, no, the real story of America is slavery and abuse of colored people and genocide and there's nothing else. I think that kind of a exaggeration leads to a false moral black and white binary and leads to disrespect for America, disrespect for people. White becomes not just white privilege, but white is a form of a sin. I think that's wrong and it's, it's incorrect. And what's more, uh, a lot of this being done in the name of the Palestinian and the occupation, but it turns out in the form of therefore delegitimating Israel, which is which again is wrong and moral. And the, the Palestinians again are given a kind of a, a moral blank check. Uh, so I think we have to push back in the best sense for the Palestinian sake. I'll come to that in a second, not just for the Jewish sense. First of all, we need to remind people that Israel won the West Bank in a war of self-defense, not an occupation. Secondly, that it offered an, a two-state solution with 97% of the West Bank and offsetting land for the rest because it really was wanted to make, we all would like to have the dignity of the Palestinians' national sovereignty fully realized alongside ours. It is a tragedy. It is a Nakba for them, but they brought it upon themselves in the Arab countries and we want to they give them a chance to find dignified and self-sovereignty. Self but they turn down these offers because they really do deny Israel's right to exist. That not just Hamas, Arafat, and that's really the great tragedy in Israel. The second intifada was a turning point because people realized suddenly when they were offered peace and a chance for a second state, instead they chose terror, violence, unlimited. And in the end, the most Israelis, the whole voting public shifted. The center and the left, much of it concluded that the Palestinians will never accept Israel's right to exist. And that explains a lot of what's happened ever since, including the fact that Israel has moved to the right, more so than I would prefer, and more so than I agree with. Now, saying this background, I also want to say, I think the new United Arab Emirates Agreement, Bahrain, are breakthroughs because they push behind the whole delegitimate of Israel. And if it wasn't for this delegitimation, which the Palestinians continue to do, Iran could not threaten Israel to throw a nuclear bomb. People would say, you're not human, you're not minimally Islamic, but they can as long as you continue this false delegation of Israel. In fact, if I may allow myself, I think the, the Kushner plan for two states is I think the best plan has been offered all these years. I think the tragedy here is that Trump and Kushner have so lack credibility because of the domestic issues that people won't listen. But in fact, I think even the idea of 30% annexation, if you look closely, what it said was Israel will not have to evacuate any of the settlements. Now, the truth is the settlements wouldn't be there if the Palestinians had made peace. And if they, if they continue to not negotiate and make peace, there'll be more settlements. And at some point, it will tip. But at this point, what he's saying is you don't have to evacuate those settlements anymore. If they really want to live in peace, they will live in peace with Jews and Palestinians cheek by jowl. And secondly, you won't have to evacuate Jordan Valley, which is the main defense line of Israel against to, to its, to its uh, east. And therefore, these are ways of saying that the Palestinians can have a state without threatening Israel, and that's critical. So the Palestinians can negotiate. If they will negotiate, they can get that 30% considerably reduced. If they can convince the Israel, you don't need to hold the Jordan Valley because we're really been give you protection. If they can convince Israel that they're not going to persecute these the settlements and so on. So my answer is that the Kushner plan says they have to turn to democracy and that democracy would give them a much better life and a much better economic opportunity. So from my point of view, again, I think we have to push back against the fashionable rhetoric on the left, which uh, the radical left, which I think is not only 
delegitimating Israel. It's also um, damaging, in my judgment, leading the Palestinians to continue a blind alley and a, and a self-denial, which is only going to hurt them for the future. Now, this is not to deny that there are, and Israel is to the right, and not to deny, I'll speak again. Netanyahu has, I think, been a great prime minister, but he also, I think, has serious flaws. And I am deeply worried that in trying to protect himself against the trial that he will damage Israel's judicial structures. I'm not saying that Israel is a, a perfect place. I'm saying we as American Jews can support Israel, but also critique them. But I think we should trust Israel. It has been an amazing democracy. And we have to trust them that they will work this out without the catastrophic threats that everybody keeps yelling are gonna happen now. And therefore, to put it simply, Israel, and we have to remind our children, is the startup nation leading the world in so many areas of medicine and, and technology which improve life, that the IDF remains the most moral army in the world, with all the flaws and all the mistakes. Uh, Ken pointed out that America and the allies in Afghanistan made a major effort to bring down civilian casualties and brought it down to three to one. And that was an amazing accomplishment, right? Well, in Gaza, where Israel faces an enemy who has deliberately embedded all their military stuff inside civilian territory. Israel brought it down to one-to-one. -to -one. It's amazing effort, self-control, risking their own soldiers, at changing, developing better weapons. The point is we have to share this and not be embarrassed to say it to our millennials and to our awe people. And I, I would also argue that of course, and this is my part of my answer to your final question here. We have to bring our youth to Israel. That's what Birthright Israel is about. I would argue that we have to expand the programs where people study in Israel, not just for 10 days, but for months. I think these are great programs that strengthen American identity and diaspora Jewish identity. But at the same time, seeing the real thing, it's so stunning the impact of the diaspora, um, diaspora Jews of the visits to Israel where they see firsthand. You don't see through the ideology and through the radical denials. You see it firsthand, including the flaws, including all the problems. But it comes out, it's such a remarkable, miraculous accomplishment. So again, my feeling is, am I worried? Yes. Do I think we have to make a major effort? Yes. But I also think we have to work on the millennials, that they have to become more sophisticated, not swallow every trend and every, you know, every um, um, progressive uh, mis, you know, misstatement or and so that's I think that's uh, let's say Jew I, we are a counterculture that means in conservative circles we should be pointing out the need for progressive activities and progressive circles the need to respect the, the conservative and the traditional and the established that's ab absolutely and we need to we need to couch all of our criticisms uh, whether it's with each other or Israel with with with, with the Havas Israel with with a love of of one another, because we are in this together, and uh, as as um, as we've learned through history. So, in our last um, in our last minute, uh, would you um, would you? I, and I don't know if you want to do it as a teacher or as a rabbi or a, a, a sage, a philosopher, but give us a blessing, Rabbi, for for the yontif and for the year uh, for our community, please, as as we close out this this really wonderful session. Thank you so much. Uh, I guess I should I should call upon the traditional the traditional blessings that are said all ten days of these days between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur that we pray that God will give us a renew year renew the coming year for goodness and for blessing meaning blessing by the way in Jewish tradition really means the overflow of life that it should be a year not only of health but of people embracing life of increasing love of greater solidarity of building and not being intimidated and not being thrown off. So my blessing would be that, that not just that God give us his blessing, but that we give each other this blessing. You, you know, Jacob wouldn't let the angel, he wrestled with the angel all night and then he wouldn't let him go. He said, unless you give me a blessing. But, but in the end, I, the, the blessing, of course, not just from God, the blessing is between us as human beings to be a blessing for each other. The Torah promised Abraham, God promised Abraham that his children will be a blessing for the world. And I believe that our giving as families, I believe that our giving and our model and our creation of our own culture and reaching out 
each other as well as turning to help the rest of the world should be a blessing. So my blessing is that we be a blessing and that we bless each other. And the coming year be a blessing year, a year of life and health and resurgence of human freedom and human capacity. Amen. Amen. And our blessing to you, Rabbi, is that you should continue to have the strength and vigor and wisdom to continue to, to uh, give us your Torah 120 and beyond. Thank you so much for doing this. I, I enjoyed it almost too much uh, to, to, to have been uh, anything other than a, a, a labor of love. Uh, it, it is such a, a treat to spend this time with you. To, to, to the people still online, I, I think uh, overwhelmingly people stuck with us. Um, 40 days and 40 nights is just one way that we have of trying to stay together as a community. Um, so stick with us, uh, tune into our virtual events, take advantage of the resources that, that uh, the shuls and the schools and, and all the agencies are offering um, and uh, just continue to love and take care uh, of one another. Rabbi Gamarto, thank you so much and thank you all of you for, for participating.